Good morning, everyone. My name is Alex Witcher, and I am the event producer here at the BIA. Welcome to our webinar this morning titled Developing, Feeding and Restoring the Human Microbiome. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on YouTube from next week. Please feel free to send the link to your colleagues afterwards. We'll be taking questions at the end, so please use the questions box uh, on the right of your screen if you would like to ask a question at any point throughout the webinar. We will then address these at the end. We are very lucky to have our three speakers joining us today. We have Dr. Lindsay Hall, research leader at the Quadrum Institute, who will start off explaining the development of the microbiome in early life. We have Dr. Alan Walker, senior lecturer at the University of Aberdeen, who will explain how diet can affect the microbiota. And we have Professor Arjan Narbad, research leader at the Quadrum Institute, who will finish off by talking um, us through restoration of the microbiome and fecal transplants. So without further ado, I will pass over to Dr. Lindsay Hall to introduce the microbiome. So good morning, everybody. What I'm going to do for the next kind of 15 minutes um, is give you a brief introduction to the microbiota itself and then more specifically walk you through the important aspects of the early life window and development of the microbiota. So first of all, um, um, we are home to an unbelievably diverse microbial ecosystem, and that's both on and within the body. So it really is a fantastic time to be a microbiologist in terms of understanding how these microbes are critical for our everyday lives. Um, in terms of kind of ecosystems, because there's a lot of ecological concepts that are important with regards to microbial um, communities, um, our own microbiome contains hundreds of trillions of different types of microbes, and that's bacteria, viruses, fungi and archaea as well, although bacteria are the most well studied to date. So these are just some, the image there is just some of the different parts of the body where you find um, microbiome communities, including the stomach, obviously on your skin, the gentle urinary tract has its own microbial communities, the oral and the respiratory tract, including the lung, and obviously the gastrointestinal tract as well, which really is the most well studied. As a field, we're moving kind of away from understanding, I guess, the names of these different types of microbes, so who they are, but actually, importantly, what additional benefits do they provide for us? And that's important because even though we've got hundreds of trillions of these different types of microbes, the genetic material that they encode is 150 times more than actually what we encode in our own human genome, which begins to give you some of the scope of how important these microbes are for our everyday lives and for our health. So as I've mentioned, the gastrointestinal tract or the gut is really the most widely studied. But going back to kind of ecosystems, the gastrointestinal tract is obviously very different depending on where you are. And obviously each of these different kind of places in the gastrointestinal tract represent different environmental niches, which means that different microbes can live there. So we obviously, within the context of microbiome research, we use stool sampling quite regularly to understand what microbes might be present, but this doesn't necessarily replicate what microbes are present in the different parts of the GI tract. Or more importantly, if we've got different microbes in, say, the mucus layer that lies over the surface of the gut epithelium um, or in terms of in the lumen. So it's just important to think about that when you're beginning to think about the gut microbiome. So as I've mentioned, depending on where you are in the gastrointestinal tract, you will have different environmental niches, which means you have different types of bacteria living there. And that also equates to the pure density of those microbes that you find. In terms of the, I guess, the broad um, overview of the types of um, microbes at a phylum level, we've got proteobacteria, actinobacteria, firmicutes and bacteroidetes. And these are really the four main bacterial groups that we find within the gastrointestinal tract. Although, of course, there's unbelievable complexity belonging to those different phyla. So the field of microbiome research has kind of really come to the fore in the last i'd say kind of 10 15 years and that's very much gone hand in hand with technology development so something that we used that we obviously was kind of done and we understood that we had these microbes um, many years ago is using kind of traditional microbiology culturing to actually grow live microbes 
But that's something that still is very, very important in the context of microbiome research, because you have to have live microbes if you want to actually do some mechanistic studies. And as a field, we really need to be doing these mechanistic studies to understand how these microbes are important for our health. Obviously, with the advent of DNA and RNA sequencing and the reducing costs in doing these kind of sequencing methodologies, we're able now to understand the sheer complexity of the microbial communities that are harbored within the gut. And this allows us to very, <clears throat> very quickly determine if there's potentially similarities or differences between, for example, diseased um, cohorts versus healthy cohorts. And it really is incredible. In in terms of the cost associated with this type of technology but really um the there has to go hand in hand in terms of this dna rna kind of barcoding with the culturing in order to really drive forward microbiome research and i just want to stress that point so what about the development of the microbiota so kind of where does it come from and how does it change as we age and then i'll go on to talk more specifically about the early life developmental window well, the microbiome changes um, drastically over the course of our um, lives, um, and this is impacted by numerous different factors, and I'll talk about them in a minute. So the dogma at the moment is that we are sterile at birth, and we really pick up the majority of our microbes um, during the birthing process. And that's important, and I'll talk about a bit more about it on the next slide, but about why that's an important developmental window. Um, by the time you're an adult, we have a fairly stable ecosystem, which is highly diverse with lots of different microbes. And Arjan and Alan will talk a bit more about those kind of um, external factors that might impact those ecosystems. And then really when we move into kind of older years and in elderly patients and elderly healthy volunteers, the microbiome is less diverse than as an adult. But really the important window is looking at early life colonization. So as I've mentioned, the dogma at the moment is that we are sterile We are sterile in utero, although there's evidence to suggest that certainly microbial products can potentially get in and start programming the immune system at those first stages of life. But we really do pick up the majority of our bacteria at birth, and that's really through vertical transmission. So that's when a baby is going through the birth canal, picking up beneficial microbes, um, and that basically starts this microbial colonization. So at these time points, we've got relatively low numbers of bacteria and there's very low diversity, which means the ecosystem is highly unstable. When babies are moved on to kind of solid food, so moving from a milk based diet, um, there's obviously increased in diversity because clearly you've got a far higher um, nutritional environment, which enables lots of different bacteria to grow. And Alan will talk about that a bit more in the next um, presentation. And interestingly, really, by the time we're two to three years of age, we have kind of the microbes that will stay with us for most of our life. So in terms of how long lived humans are, that's a relatively short window in which to kind of look after and develop our um, microbial communities. Um, in my lab in particular, we're interested in a specific group of bacteria called bifidobacterium. And we're interested in bifidobacterium because it's found at very high levels in vaginally delivered breastfed babies. And we kind of see bif as one of these microbial pioneers or one of these founder species that actually is really important in colonizing. And it's also important because they actually provide us with numerous different health benefits, including modulation of the immune system. And I'll talk a little bit more about that next. So if we think about when we have high levels of bifidobacterium and how this potentially correlates to the immune system, and this is just a kind of graphic representation here from our review we did towards the end of last year, you can see that the very high levels of bifidobacteria also correlate with when your immune system is developing in terms of when the numbers of these immune cells are increasing and also in terms of when differentiation and maturation of immune processes is happening. So that's why we think that understanding how bifidobacteria is able to communicate with host immune cells in the early life window is really important. So we've known for many years that if a baby has high levels of bifidobacterium, these babies are normally seen to be more healthy. Um, and that's important because it also links to kind of reductions in the number of like for example visits to the hospital or number of courses of antibiotics but we don't really understand what that link between high levels of BIF and health is. 
We've known obviously for many years that lots of different strains and species of bifidobacterium have been used as probiotics. Um, although, of course, we can't use the term probiotic to um, link that to health because we don't have good enough health claims behind it, which is why it's important to study these bacteria in order to under understand the mechanisms of health benefits. However, there's numerous data from both clinical trials and also from in vivo models that indicate that bifidobacterium potentially has beneficial health effects, and this is specifically linked to immune programming. And this is also true for gut associated kind of immune programming, but also looking at the immune system at systemic sites as well. However, as I've mentioned, we don't really understand the underlying mechanisms of how bifidobacterium programs the immune system, both mucosally and systemically, which is why we need to do these mechanistic studies. And that's really, this is obviously I'm giving bifidobacterium as an example, but this is fundamental for understanding a whole host of other microbes that call the gut home. So just to give you a bit of an overview about what we know so far in terms of how the microbiota is linked to immune development, and this is just broadly rather than thinking about BIF specifically, when we've got a diverse and a balanced um, gut microbiota, um, these interact very closely with the intestinal epithelial cells that line the gastrointestinal tract, this single cell layer that's really important for forming a strong barrier. Um, Metabolites produced by microbiota members as well as themselves might be important with maintaining this um, epithelial barrier. And an example of this will be short chain fatty acids. And Alan will talk a little bit more about them in the next presentation. And as I've mentioned, this is really important for strengthening this barrier because, especially because we now understand that there's numerous different pathological conditions associated mm. with a leaky barrier. These microbes are also very important for increasing the mucus layer that overlies the intestinal epithelium, which forms another very important barrier, which is important for maintaining health. These microbes also start um, programming these um, intestinal epithelial cells to express additional immune receptors that are important for actually setting off immune responses, say in response to actually a pathogenic bacterium coming into the system. They're really important for starting immune signaling cascades, including the production of cytokines, which are really important for downstream immunological processes. These cytokines are then very important for actually specifically um, maturing and differentiating other immune populations, including adaptive immune cells like T cells and B cells, and B cells produce antibodies but also for innate immune cells, including mast cells, natural killer cells, dendritic cells and macrophages. So really, we, we now understand that these microbes are critical for differentiating a whole host of different components of the immune system, which does make it rather complex to study, but also begins to understand why it is so important to maintain a healthy microbial ecosystem. And as I've mentioned, this is important from a mucosal perspective, so specifically within the gastrointestinal tract, but also systemically as well. So this is important because these microbes are important for maintaining and our immune system. So if we disturb these microbial communities, there's potentially consequences for our health and increased risk of certain diseases. So there's just a list here of certain um, external factors that might be associated with changing the microbes that we have in the gut, including diet, infections, antibiotics play a massive role. Stress, interestingly, also has a big role to play depending on how you're, how you're born, so C-section versus vaginal delivery, and obviously what your host genetics is as well. So more specifically, and I'll just quickly go over these because Alan's going to talk about this, it might be that diet impacts what specific microbes are present. Antibiotics are important because they don't just target the pathogenic bacteria, they also target beneficial bacteria as well. And if you're born by cesarean section, you will get different types of microbes than if you're vaginally delivered. And these are all the different types of diseases that have been associated, and I have put that in bold, um, with disturbances in the microbiota, because that's something that's just important to think about, that we know that there's differences, but actually those differences directly relate to disease initiation. So where do we have opportunities for translation? So obviously, as the microbiota is really important in specifically immune system development, there's a number of different avenues. So we could think about potentially modulating the microbiota itself, maybe introducing new microbes or through diet or potentially a combination of both. 
And then these are just some of the conditions that I think that the microbiome can potentially be important for. And then I've done a rough kind of estimate of where I think the time is to translation because we need to do lots of mechanistic studies to understand and bring products to the market. And these are just a couple of examples where I think the microbiome is really going to be important, including diagnostic and um, targeted microbiota cocktails and um, assessment of fecal microbiota transplant, which Arjan's going to talk about. And obviously thinking about global health. So let's not just think about humans, but actually think about animal health as well. So where are we with immune modulatory therapies and microbiome? Well, this is really kind of this is a very um, very topical at the moment. And actually one of the major um, focuses of numerous different groups is actually studying, studying how these microbes might actually augment cancer therapies. And what I mean by that is immune, choice, immune checkpoint inhibitors. And there's some really interesting work on that. And more complex um, diseases, including ulcerative colitis, where actually FMT might be important, suggests that these microbes could actually be involved with actually changing immune responses and actually improving outcomes in patients. Um, more specifically, um, just for BIF, um, bifidobacterium plays different roles in different diseases, which is why you need to be understanding them in different contexts. Um, this makes it quite complicated, um, and this is why you need to be looking at how different strains and species might play different roles, because that's something that's fundamental, is that depending on the strain, they will have a different impact on the immune system, and that's just something to bear in mind. Mm. And just finally, obviously, we need to do these mechanistic studies with the idea of actually moving into clinical settings. So just very briefly, we have a study looking at understanding how microbiota therapies might be able to help premature babies, because premature babies have a different microbiota in comparison to full term babies. Um, and obviously, these babies have a very underdeveloped immune system, which makes them very susceptible to different diseases, including necrotizing enterocolitis. Um, but probiotics, um, including bifidobacterium, have potentially been shown to be important for reducing incidence of this particular pathological condition. And we've just got one study where we're trying to understand how um, supplementation of premature babies with specific microbes might be beneficial for their health. And just to highlight as well, we'll also be starting a new pregnancy and early life cohort study here in Norwich with recruitment starting at the end of the year, which is really exciting. So something I just want to signpost you to is key steps for translation. The Microbiology Society um, performed a massive um, kind of evidence collecting exercise last year, and they did a report that all of us here, Alan, Arjana, myself, were involved in, um, in terms of understanding how we can bring microbiome basically to the clinic and can we translate it. So please do have a look at this report. These are just a couple of the ones that I think are really important, which is building the evidence facilitating translation of therapies, and also actually importantly engaging with the public about why microbiome research is really important. So please do go and have a read of that. It's um, it's really detailed and provides some really excellent additional information for you then. And then that's me done. So the next is to hand over to Alan. Great. <clears throat> so thank you very much, Lindsay, for uh, setting the scene perfectly for my talk there, which is going to be about the impact of diet on the microbiota. And so, as Lindsay's alluded to, uh, the impact of diet goes right back to the very early days of human life. Um, basically, uh, infants who are fed and grown on breast milk have a very different microbiota to infants who are consuming formula. And so, as Lindsay said, uh, infants taking the breast milk, they, they have a rapid and selective expansion of the bifidobacteria group that Lindsay talked about. And that's essentially because breast milk contains uh, nutrition for these microbes. It contains human milk oligosaccharides. And these selectively promote the growth of the bifidobacteria. And as Lindsay's alluded to in her talk, this may come with all sorts of potential health impacts and benefits to the growing child. And again, in informally fed babies where these human milk oligosaccharides are not present, a different microbial community, a more adult-like, a more diverse community develops. And again, the field is just getting a grip on what impact that might have uh, for the developing human. Um, now, diet, uh, the impacts basically are maintained throughout the rest of your life. It's not just important when you're an infant. Uh, and post weaning, of course, uh, this comes with the introduction of a whole range of complex polysaccharides, things like fiber in the diet. And that really drives significant changes in the microbiota. So the bifidobacteria become less dominant. 
uh, and instead other groups, the ones that can break down some of these fibres become dominant instead. And again, uh, fibre consumption, it seems, is consociated with huge computational changes uh, and activities of the microbiota. And that's something I'm going to cover in detail over the next few slides. And so what are the substrates that are available for uh, microbes in the gut? Um, well, of course, the, the simple sugars and things that we consume in our diet, those are mostly absorbed in the small intestine by us. And so what's left over by the time it reaches the colon is some of the more recalcitrant, difficult to break down uh, substrates. And so uh, the range obviously varies with, from person to person, depending on what they eat. But the main substrates really in the West are things like resistant starches and then uh, non-starch polysaccharides, the sort of plant fibers, the celluloses, hemicelluloses, for example. Um, there is also some simpler sugars that make it through to the, uh, the colon and also host secretions, things like mucins that are present as well. So this is the range of uh, substrates that are available for uh, microbial breakdown in the gut. And we know that microbes are actually extremely efficient at breaking down some of these uh, compounds. Um, so if you look at something like pure cellulose, that, uh, that's basically the very hardcore molecule that constitutes the plant cell wall. That's very difficult to microbes to break down. But the kind of celluloses that are present in normal diets, the things that are in plant fibres, uh, evidence from uh, going back many decades has shown that actually most of these are broken down by the microbes as uh, they pass through the gut. And so this process really involves a number of different functional groups. Um, when the, 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 the carbohydrates we consume, like I say, uh, has a mixture of both soluble and insoluble carbohydrates and simpler sugars, and different microbes seem to be involved in breaking these down. And so the, uh, the insoluble fibers that arrive here in the gut can be colonized by a certain select group of microbes. These are the, uh, the primary degraders. These break those down into more soluble polysaccharides, which can then become available for more general polysaccharide utilizers. And again, these can also break these down into shorter oligosaccharides and sugars, which are available to specialist groups of uh, sugar uh, utilizers. Uh, and also within the gut, when these things are growing, they're producing a lot of uh, intermediate products, and they can be cross-fed by other groups of microbes too. But fundamentally, the end product of all of this growth and fermentation of the microbes in the gut are a range of metabolic products, which primarily uh, of interest to us are the short-chain fatty acids. Those are the main endpoints and some gases. Um, and the, the, the short-chain fatty acids in particular are interesting because that's kind of our payback for hosting these microbes. We give them the place to live, we give them the diet, and in return, we absorb back a lot of these uh, products, including in particular these short-chain fatty acids. And so it turns out the short chain fatty acids are probably one of the main reasons why consuming fiber is good for us and good for our gut health. Uh, lots of research over the many decades now has shown they have a range of beneficial impacts on host health. Uh, for example, uh, they feed the cells that line our colon, they absorb these short chain fatty acids and they use them for energy, uh, in particular butyrate, one of the short chain fatty acids. That's the main source, about 70% of the energy requirements of your human colonic cells come from butyrate. And so these uh, increase the energy yield from our diet. We get around 5 to 10% of our calories per day by the activities of microbes breaking down fiber. Now, of course, this is probably not needed in the Western overfed world. But again, ancestrally, when human beings were consuming a lot more of the sort of tough to break down plant uh, fibers, this extra energy coming from microbes is probably essential to our survival. Um, so it's not just about energy extraction. Uh, these short chain fatty acids also have a number of impacts uh, on uh, health, both in the gut and systemically. Uh, butyrate in particular has been shown to be anti-inflammatory, it dampens down inflammation. It's also potentially uh, anti-carcinogenic because it uh, induces the death of cancer cells uh, in, in, uh, in vivo trials. Uh, there's also emerging evidence that uh, some of these acids can inhibit the growth of pathogens. And again, work coming out of mouse models shows that some of these might actually influence satiety and make us feel fuller after eating as well. And so there's huge interest in these. Um, and again, um, this is one of the major areas of work. Now, if you look through the, work, uh, the, the gut, uh, levels of short chain fatty acids aren't consistent throughout the gut. Uh, in the proximal colon where most of these substrates arrive, you get rapid degradation by the microbiota there. So you get higher short chain fatty acid levels in the proximal colon. And as these substrates are utilized along the length of the colon, you get less and less um, uh, carbohydrate fermentation, lower SCFA amounts, and more protein degradation instead. And I'm going to come back to that in a later slide. But this may be one of the reasons why gut problems tend to be more common in the distal part of the colon as opposed to the proximal. So. Um, 
that's not the only benefit of consuming fibre. It's not just about the SCFAs. We know that obviously consuming fibre increases transit time. Your, your food passes faster through the colon. And this means that actually there's less time for the microbes to break down things like the proteins and do the putrefactive fermentation. So just the, the virtue fact that the microbiota is being pushed through the colon faster means there's probably less exposure to some of the deleterious compounds the microbiota can form. And I'll come back to that in the next slide or so. Um, the breakdown of the microbiota, uh, the breakdown of fibre, sorry, by the microbiota is also considered to be really a key part in the release of some bioactive phytochemicals from the plant. So if we just consume the fibre alone, it would, without the microbiota, it would essentially pass through our body untouched. Um, but because of the fact that the microbiota breaks the fibre down, it also releases a bunch of bound phytochemicals that are attached to these cell wall structures. So it's, it's, it's actually the activity of the microbiota, and this can vary from person to person, that plays a key role in the release of some beneficial bioactive molecules. Uh, and also the microbiota can, uh, as I've said at the bottom, produce things like vitamins from some of the fibres we consume. So there's a whole range of different benefits that come from fibre that can be attributed to some of their impacts on the microbiota. So fibre has impacts, of course, itself that are beneficial, but many of these, it turns out, really are mediated via the gut microbes. And so this leads us to the, the situation that we're finding ourselves in the West, where actually, ancestrally, we're now consuming far less fibre than we would have done in many societies as humans evolved. And there's now accumulating evidence to suggest that this may not be great for our gut health. And um, the sort of low carb diets that we take here, the ones that are low in fiber, this leads to a, a much greater reduction in the amount of short chain fatty acids that are produced by the microbiota, and in particular levels of butyrate. And as I said previously, butyrate is particularly thought to be beneficial for a number of different reasons. And so the, the extra disadvantage that comes with having less fiber is that the extra protein and peptide metabolism, this is also thought to produce this putrefactive fermentation with things like nitrosamines, amines, indoles, things that are potentially detrimental to human health are produced from protein and peptide fermentation. So this shift towards a Western diet may not be doing great things for our gut health. Um, beyond just the general lack of fiber and the increase in proteins and peptides, there's now evidence, again, which mostly has come from mouse models at this stage, suggesting that a range of the components that are much higher in the Western diet, things like fat, cholesterol, uh, sweeteners and emulsifiers, there's evidence suggests that these might be altering the microbiota in a negative way as well, and these are leading to conditions such as inflammation. Now, again, I stress that most of this work has come from mouse models, and we really do need to follow this up with human studies before we can say for certain that these things actually are harmful. But again, there's a compelling image coming together that the Western diet overall is probably less beneficial for our gut health than the ancestral one that was high in fiber. And so again, we put this all together, as Lindsay alluded to, the microbiota is linked to a whole range of different diseases, both in the gut and systemic. And I think really there's a, a greater appreciation of what we eat is playing a key role in this. So basically the higher fiber diets are promoting more beneficial bacteria. You've got a range of more protective molecules produced. And this in theory lowers our risk of these diseases developing. Whereas if we have this poorer Western diet, this influences our microbiota to be perhaps producing more damaging molecules. And again, this may be increasing our risk of developing these diseases. So again, as Lindsay says, this is an area of active research around the world at the moment. Uh, we're learning a lot more all the time, but it's certainly a compelling hypothesis that the research is being moved forward very fast. And so given these potential links to the, between the microbiota, diet and health, a key interest in the field has been altering the microbiota in some way to sort of tip it towards a more beneficial range of activities. Now, there are a range of ways we might alter the microbiota. We might use antibiotics, we might use probiotics, we might use diet, fecal transplants, which Arjan is going to talk about in his talk. And of course, the aim of all of these is to shift the composition to a more beneficial state. And so really, I'm going to talk for the last little bit of my presentation here about whether it's possible to manipulate the microbiota via diet. And so, of course, there are a range of dietary interventions already available, uh, things like probiotics, prebiotics, or the combination of both, which is symbiotics, fermented foods, functional foods, all of these are aimed at uh, altering the microbiota. But I think the key thing we have to appreciate when we're doing this is that altering the microbiota is an ecological problem, which Lindsay also has alluded to in her talk. And so you have to think of the gut almost like a rainforest. It's filled with organisms that are already there. They're all fighting for resources. They're already occupying that environment. And so if we're trying to selectively improve the growth of one particular group that we think is beneficial, how do you selectively promote that one group against that backdrop of all the other organisms that are present in the environment? And so 
I would argue, and I think the research is moving towards this, is actually maybe we need to move towards more specific interventions that are stratified towards a more individual intervention. And so I think the problem we have is that we've now identified, this is work that we've done in Aberdeen and other people have done, that many different gut microbiota species can be altered by identical dietary ingredients. And so I've given a few examples here on this slide showing the microbes that we've shown in the past that will respond to various interventions, things like uh, wheat bran, starches, pectins, they will all promote different bacteria, but they also promote a range of different bacteria. And so what this means for the host is that if you happen to have one particular bug in your gut that responds to pectin, but Lindsay has a different one, we will show different responses to a pectin in, uh, intervention simply because of our underlying baseline microbiota. And so this is likely to have implications for host health. And so out of the microbes I've listed here, I've highlighted in red the butyrate producers, for example. So if the aim is to produce uh, more butyrate from a pectin intervention, if you have F. Brasnitzii in your gut, then great, that will probably work for you. If you don't have F. Brasnitzii, then perhaps pectin isn't going to be a butyrogenic intervention for you. And so I think the key thing is that we really probably need to look towards more stratification and look towards more highly individualized responses because we will get non-target organisms being promoted. It's not enough to just say, I'll give someone inulin and the bifids will be promoted. They might be in some people, but in other people, other groups will definitely be enriched as well. And so we haven't yet really worked out as a field which are the, be the, the beneficial bugs we should be promoting and which are the negative ones. And that really is something moving forward we need to do much better on before we can get towards this sort of stratification. But uh, at first, I really want just to Im illustrate the impact that this variation can have. Uh, and so this is a study we did a few years ago up in the Rout Institute. And we were basically feeding people a range of different dietary interventions. And the key one here is to focus on the RS. That's a resistant starch-based intervention. And we were looking in particular at one group, a Ruminococcus species. And essentially what you can see is that during the period of the resistant starch intervention, you've got this massive expansion in the growth of this one type of microbes. And so it's clear that, yes, you can get microbes to respond to dietary change in human subjects. And it's clear you could be reasonably predictive of which microbes will respond. However, there's an interesting trend that comes out of this, which was that two of the volunteers we worked with, which I've highlighted with the arrow here, Ruminococcus didn't respond in those. And the reason it didn't respond in those is because it wasn't there in the first place. And so the key thing is that you can give an identical dietary intervention and get a very different response depending on the baseline microbiota. And this can have implications for just general physiology of the host. Because when we went into the samples from these people that were produced during these interventions, we measured how much starch was left remaining in the stool samples from these people. And you can see here that the two people that had no ruminococcus, they weren't breaking down the starch that was present in their stool to the same extent. And so this has real implications for things like how they might extract energy from the diet. And again, starch is known to be butyrogenic, for example. And again, maybe they have less butyrate being produced. So again, how you respond is an individual thing, but also has implications potentially for host health. And so the key things to come away from this are really that short-term dietary interventions really can result in uh, microbiota responses that are reproducible, but they are limited. You can see here that as soon as the individuals went away from the resistant starch diet, they went right back down to the microbiota composition they had before the intervention. So I guess my argument here would be that if you want to have long-term uh, changes to the microbiota via diet, you're probably going to have to do long-term interventions over the course of a person's lifespan. Uh, but certainly it's possible. And so I think, bearing in mind all this inter-individual variation, I think, and many other people I think are thinking this now too, is that the microbiota really is going to tie into the emerging concept of personalized nutrition. Now, the nutrition field has now, I think, long appreciated that identical interventions really will have some people that respond and many others that don't respond. And so the rise of this sort of new omics technologies, our ability to sequence genomes and characterize proteins, has really meant that we have a much better capability of understanding why people might be responding differently. And the rise in things like wearable monitoring devices, which allow us to monitor things like uh, blood glucose levels in real time, this really feeds into the same thing. Now we can monitor in individual people how they're responding to a particular dietary intervention. And as part of that, we can now monitor the microbiota too. And so in that way, try and improve our stratification of individuals to try and improve their responses to interventions. And so if we look towards the future, Maybe this is how it will go. You go to the doctor, you get clinically tested. As part of that, they'll sequence your genome. So they have your host genome information. As part of that, you might be hooked up to various continuous monitoring devices whereby you can monitor how your own personal biology changes in response to specific interventions. 
As part of that, again, we might profile our gut microbes to find out which microbes are present and missing in our gut microbiota. And so the ideal there would be that you identify a species that's associated with health, which is missing from that person's gut. You provide it to them as a probiotic. But in order to ensure the survival of that microbe in the person's gut, you also provide a dietary ingredient that's known to promote that particular species associated with health. And so the eventual aim there is, of course, that you have a personalized nutrition approach that improves both health and reduces the risk of disease. Now, we're not there yet. I think we're moving towards it and we're filling in the pieces of the puzzle we need before we get there. But certainly, I think in the future, these sort of more personalized responses really offer the best hope of successful interventions. And so just to conclude my part of the talk here then, I think uh, just to echo Lindsay's comments, I think the ongoing revolution in microbiota research really is opening up huge possibilities for people working in both the probiotic and the diet fields. Uh, we now have a range of biomarkers that are linked to health conditions. And we now know, of course, the impact that diet can have on promoting beneficial activities, but also on the flip side, promoting potentially harmful activities and getting that balance of diet right seems to be a real opportunity, both for uh, researchers, clinicians, and obviously industry working in this field as well. And so again, my, my own personal take on it is that moving forward, we probably have to be a bit smarter. One size fits all population level approaches aren't going to work for everyone, I would suggest. And so moving towards a stratified, more personalized response uh, approaches is probably the way I think the field will improve efficacy. Um, like I say, this field is rapidly advancing and uh, it's a great time to be working in it. And with that, I will pass you over to Arjan, who will also give you some information, I guess, on how the field's advancing. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to briefly describe the application of FMT for modulation of the human gut microbiome. Now, just to recap, um, we now know the importance of the gut microbiome in, in health and disease. And as Lindsay already, already indicated, that the gut microbiome is important for the development of the mucosal immune, uh, immune system. They're also uh, uh, associated with uh, a number of uh, gut disorders, including IBD, uh, colon cancer, IBS, but they're also associated with a number of extra-intestinal disorders, such as diabetes, uh, obesity, uh, liver damage, uh, and asthma. We also know that gut microbiome plays a role in our digestive system, and they're able to biotransform some of the dietary compounds into products that are more bioactive, or in some cases, to products that are less bioactive. They can, they can also produce compounds that may be toxic. And more recently, we become aware that gut microbiome also plays a role in the development of the brain function, the so-called gut-brain axis. For a long time, we have been aware of the importance of healthy microbiome in the biocontrol of the gut pathogens in preventing their colonization and causing them uh, the infections. Now, many of the studies so far uh, indicate that the microbiome is significantly altered in the uh, disorders that I just described. And so the question is, how can we modify and restore the gut microbiome to a healthy status? So at one level, we can use narrow spectrum antimicrobials or bacteriophages that target specific bacteria or a group of bacteria. And as already described by Alan, diet uh, plays a key role in determining the structure and function of the microbiome. So we can clearly use diet and dietary components to modify the microbiome. This includes human milk oligosaccharide, resistant starch, pre and probiotics. However, we can also use a rather more powerful weapon of uh, fecal microbiota transplant that allows us to change the entire microbiome. So this is what I'm going to focus on. And so far, the best evidence for the effic efficacy of FMT is in the treatment of Clostridium difficile infection or CDI. So the organism that causes the CDI is Clostridium difficile. It is one of the so-called superbug that is a major cause of hospital-acquired infection, although there, is not, there are now um, reported 
increasingly reported in the community setting. The organism can form spores, therefore it can persist in the hospital environment, and it causes the disease by production of uh, toxins. And there's also now uh, evidence that C. difficile can also be transmitted via the food chain. So what are the symptoms of uh, CDI? Well, they range from mild to severe diarrhea, abdominal pain, fever, and in some extreme cases, they can cause a condition called pseudomembrane escalitis, and that often leads to death. And so who is at risk of CDI? Well, it's actually the, mainly the elderly, elderly patients who go into the hospital and they are given broad spectrum antibiotic, as well as immunocompromised patients that are at uh, the, most, the highest risk of CDI. In fact, over 80% of the CDI infections are reported in the people over the age of 65. Now, there is a clear association between disruption of the normal gut bacteria by the antibiotic and the risk of developing Clostridium difficile infection. And this is uh, shown in, in this short video. Now, in fact, a small proportion of the healthy population are actually asymptomatic carriers of C. difficile. However, in this individual, C. difficile do not cause any problems because of the presence of the healthy microbiome, which keep the pathogens in check. However, if we take antibiotics, then this antibiotic disrupts the composition of the healthy microbiome that then allows C. difficile pathogenic cells to proliferate, uh, produce uh, toxins, and cause the symptoms of CDI. And of course, we can treat C. difficile infection with antibiotics such as metronidazole, uh, oral vancomycin, and pridoxamycin. However, in 30% of the CDI patients, they relapse. So they then have to go back to the hospital and they are treated again with antibiotic, and this cycle continues. And of course, that leads to a risk of antibiotic resistance. But because we know that the cause of the CD field infection starts with the damage to the microbiome, so the big question is, can we use the microbiome as an alternative to antibiotic? And this is, in fact, uh, the principle behind uh, the, the FMT, where we take the microbiome of a healthy individual, individual and transplant that into a CDI patient. This idea is not uh, new. Uh, in fact, in the modern era, the first report of uh, the, the CDI was uh, first report of the use of FMT was in 1958, where four patients. Uh, with severe diarrhea, they all recovered within 48 hours. Since then, more than 200, 200 sporadic cases have been reported in the use of FMT. However, it's only in, recently that a large number of uh, randomized clinical trials have proven the efficacy of FMT for treatment of CDI. Now, many patients who are become aware of the FMT and, and are desperate for treatment are, in fact, trying this uh, FMT at home, the so-called uh, DIY FMT, using uh, kitchen utensils, and they use partner as, the, as the, the donor stool sample. Of course, this is not recommended because of the high risk of transferring pathogen from one individual to another. And in UK, we are lucky because we don't need to do that. Let me go back. Okay. We don't need to do that because NICE, the organization that approves the uh, use of new drugs, had in fact approved the use of FMT for recurrent CDI. And in Norwich, we have started to use the FMT treatment for CDI patient uh, in collaboration with the clinicians at the local hospital. And there's a good reason for uh, doing FMT under clinical supervision. And this is that we can screen the donor thoroughly. 
So we use healthy donors between age of 20 and 40, and they are excluded if they are taking antibiotics that can disturb the, the microbiome, or if they suffer from gastrointestinal problems, or if they're at high risk of carrying infective agents. So we also screen the donor stool and blood samples for absence of uh, pathogenic viruses, bacteria, and, and protozoa. And if anyone interested in the technical aspect of the, the donor selection or the treatment procedures or the patient assessment, then I would recommend reading the recently published comprehensive guidelines by British Society of Gastroenterology and uh, Healthcare Infection um, Society. Now, the uh, FMT procedure itself is quite straightforward. Um, the patient stops taking antibiotic uh, at least 24 hours before the treatment. The patient is then given enema to empty the bowels. And then either a nasogeogenal tube or a nasogastric tube is inserted through the nose by the gastroenterologist. And on the day of the, the treatment, the fecal slurry is prepared and delivered to the patient via either the NJ or NG tube. In some cases, uh, the FMT is delivered via the colonoscopy in, in patients who are really ill and, are, and, and the insertion of the tube is not uh, practically possible. The actual FMT process uh, only takes uh, 30 minutes. And uh, all the evidence so far indicate that FMT procedure has a greater than 90% success rate. Now, this compares well with the use of antibiotic in the case of recurrent CDI patients, where the success rate is only 30% in many cases. The impact of uh, FMT treatment is, is immediate and has huge effect on the patient welfare. In fact, one patient that we treated after 24 hours she said she felt much better and that she was able to have a proper sleep uh, because normally she has to go to the washroom three times a night because of diarrhea. And of course, we are, we are interested in understanding the, the mechanism of the FMT process and in other words, how does it work? And so we've been, uh, We've been analyzing the, the structure of the microbiome during the FMT treatment. Now, compared to uh, the patient, the, the donor microbiome has much higher species richness. In the patient, this bacterial diversity increases after treatment, and this diversity remains high even after a six month follow up period. If you look at the actual structure of the microbiome uh, in the patient and the donor, we see that the donor microbiome, at least at the phyla level, is dominated by bacteroidetes and formicutes, compared to the patient before treatment where their microbiome is dominated by uh, proteobacteria. Now, many of the opportunistic pathogens are in fact members of the proteobacteria. And as expected, after the treatment, the microbiome of the patient resembles that of the donor. And of course, there is now a massive opportunity to expand the application of FM2, FMT to other microbiome-related disorders. And indeed, FMT has been shown to be effective and in number of such conditions. According to the clinical trials, uh, website, um, currently there are more than 200 uh, FMT-related studies that are registered. Many of these trials are aimed at uh, infection control, for example, for CDI, urinary tract infection, um, and uh, HIV and MRSA. Metabolic, metabolic disorders of obesity and diabetes are also targeted and many other conditions where we are interested in modulating the, the microbiome towards a healthy status. 
So to summarize, if we imagine our gut microbiome as a healthy lawn, and this lawn gets damaged because of the use of uh, broad spectrum antibiotics, then we can replace this lawn using FMT to restore the healthy gut microbiome. Now, in the future, of course, we'll be using uh, capsules containing uh, fro frozen or pre-dried uh, fecal samples. And in fact, several studies uh, have actually shown that this method can be effective. Ultimately though, we can replace the, the use of the FMT entirely by using defined mix of bacteria. And a, and a study um, has already shown this using mice model that um, a defined mix of bacteria can be used. And this study was in fact uh, co-authored by Alan. Uh, so I think this um, FMT has a significant future uh, for treatment of microbiome associated disorders. And as we move forward, uh, I can see that we will have slightly different products which are much more characterized and, and defined. So thank you. Thank you very much um, to all the speakers for a comprehensive explainer of the microbiome and this very exciting research that's taking place in this area. So I just wanted to ask, um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, if you do, please type it into the questions box. Okay, so we have a couple of questions already. I will read them out and then the speakers can answer. So we have, how do we, how do we look look to achieve personalized stratification and targeted microbiological interventions? That would be for me then, I guess. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the, the, the stratification part is becoming easier as the sequencing costs come down. Um, there are a few companies getting into this space now where they will, as part of that, will basically sequence your microbiome first. And then based on what we know already about which microbes respond to particular dietary ingredients, they will try and design a diet to, to work with that. And that's, that's, that's really an emerging area. But fundamentally, the stratification part, uh, that, that relies on technology. Uh, this can be done already. I think the part that really still needs some work is on the interpretation. So we, we, can, we can profile the microbiota pretty easily. <laughs> it's just working out which are the good ones, which are the bad ones, and which might respond. And that's really the area that I'm most interested in, the area that research really has to push forward over the next few years. Okay, we have another uh, one. What is the official NHS England position on FMT? For example, is it available nationally or is it subject to postcode prescription? Okay, so um, as I as I mentioned in my presentation, the NICE has actually allowed us to use FMT, but currently they only allow us to use it for recurrent CDI. And uh, in fact, there are several centers in the UK that are already providing this, this service. So obviously in, in Norwich, we are providing that. There's, there's uh, uh, Birmingham, uh, Portsmouth, uh, London, um, so currently, uh, the FMT is only permitted for recurrent CDI. However, if we want to apply the FMT for other disorders, then the FMT now is now comes under uh, the MHRA. So we need to obtain MHRA license, both for production of the FMT material, as well as undertaking clinical trials for FMT. Okay, and following on from that, we have another question. Have there been any toxic reactions to, to FMT? Okay, so um, to date, more than, I guess, around the world, probably more than 2,000 FMT treatments have been done. Uh, however, the, the side effects are very rare, uh, and most of them are, in fact, um, are mild and self-containing. So these are related to, to bloating or, or stomach pains. However, there have been one or two reports of uh, slightly serious adverse effect of bacteremia, uh, perforation, and and uh, and even there was a report of one person claiming that uh, they put weight on after the FMT treatment. 
Okay, we have one final question. Um, there's been a recent paper in Cell which suggests that probiotics are largely expelled from the gut. Could you comment? Yes, yeah, so I would hope that everybody has actually gone back and read the two papers that were published in Cell rather than just relying on the journalism behind those two articles. Um, they're both very interesting studies. Um, they are, and they do highlight that these probiotics, certainly in a normal homeostasis, and what I mean by that is kind of a healthy ecosystem, don't stay around for very long. And that very that work very much line, aligns with numerous other studies that have been performed by different researchers around the world. Um, and then, of course, there was the also the other study that was looking at how antibiotic-induced perturbations and how probiotics or a kind of a self FMT are able to restore the ecosystem. Um, so the numbers of individuals in those studies was relatively small. Um, they highlighted, as I highlighted in my talk, that stool samples don't necessarily um, replicate what's present in the mucosal microbiota, which isn't necessarily that much of a surprise. Um, but something I would say is that those studies didn't look at any health outcomes for those microbiota differences. And it's kind of going back to some of the um, discussions that Arjan and Alan also highlighted that we need to be thinking about how those microbial differences actually specifically link to health outcomes. So I think the technology that underpins those studies is really exciting. and I think they are both interesting mm -hmm. studies, but the authors even themselves didn't claim that necessarily there was massive um, negative consequences because they only looked at microbial differences rather than actually impacts on host health. So I think these kind of studies are really important because clearly if you want to provide an intervention you need to have something that's going to colonize to be able to have a health um, impact but I wouldn't say necessarily that it means that everything out there at the moment, nothing is going to work. I don't know if Alan or Arjan wants to comment on that as well. Yeah, I could probably just add one more thing, I think, which is that we really have a problem with the word probiotic, because probiotic encompasses literally hundreds of different types of microbes. Uh, even if it's the same species, a microbe can have different impacts. So, I mean, it's essentially claiming that because Usain Bolt and I are both humans, I'm equally as fast as Usain Bolt, which is clearly <laughs> ridiculous, is. right? And so I think this still comes back to the personalized stratification that there will be probiotics that work for some people that don't work for other people. And really what the field has to do is move towards working out which are the ones that will work for particular people and in what conditions. So it's again, being a lot smarter than just taking the pot off the shelf and assuming that it'll work for every single person because hopefully what's come across in these talks is that the microbiota is complex and we have to be much smarter in how we try and do these interventions. That's my top and worth anyway. Okay, so we have time for, there's one quick one at the end. So what is the cost of FMT and how does it compare to the other therapeutic alternatives? Okay, so for, for treating a patient using antibiotics, it costs probably in the region of seven to 9,000 pounds. FMT on the other hand is, is quite cheap. Are you only talking about a few hundred pounds? How, and in fact, most of the cost of FMT is related to the screening of, of the donor because that is actually quite quite key, and it, and and uh, we o we often need to, in fact, we we, we screen the donor uh, every six months. So that's where the FMT cost is relatively cheap, but it's it's very effective compared to the antibiotics. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. Well, we're coming to the end, so we we should wrap up now. Um, so thank you again to all the speakers. Um, if anyone thinks of any questions later, we can take questions by email and we're happy to forward these on to the speakers. Um, so I have a couple of words from us. Um, we are the BIA, the Trade Association for Innovative Life Sciences in the UK. If you are not a member and are interested in joining, please do get in contact or go to our website for more information. So I just want to mention a few events coming up in the near future. We have Women in Biotech next week on the 19th of September. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, STEM, advocating women in STEM subjects. Then we have the joint BIA and Harwell Campus Networking Lunch on the 3rd of October, and our annual UK Bioscience Forum in London on the 18th of October, and the UK Bioprocess Bioprocess Conference in Edinburgh on the 20th of November. 
So please do go to our website, www.bioindustry.org to check this out. As I said before, this webinar will go up on the BIA YouTube channel from next week, and we will email you the link early next week. So please feel free to forward the link on to any colleagues you think might be interested. Thank you very much to all our speakers and everyone who has joined the webinar, and I hope you have a good afternoon.